Many children dream of following in their father's footsteps, but our next guest took a decidedly different path when he realized his father embraced a doctrine of violence and murder. When Zach Ibrahim was seven years old, his father shot and killed the founder of the Jewish Defense League. A few years later, while behind bars, his father was convicted of helping to mastermind the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. For nearly two decades, Zach Ibrahim kept his identity a secret. But recently, he made the courageous choice to take a stand against the dogma of hatred and bigotry espoused by his father. Following his heart and intuition, he's become a voice for peace and tolerance. His incredible journey is chronicled in his new book, The Terrorist Son, A Story of Choice. Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you know, I couldn't help but think as I was reading your book, you know, when I was seven, I was thinking about playing on the swing set or hanging out with my friends, um, but your life was literally turned upside down at that age. Uh, tell our viewers what happened. Well, on the night of November 5th, 1990, my father assassinated Rabbi Meir Kahana in New York City. Uh, and from that day on, um, you know, our life was turned into uh, pretty much constant chaos. Um, my family had received death threats because of my father's actions and he was also the breadwinner and so my mother in one evening was left a single mom with three children to raise on her own and uh, you know his actions pretty much turned our lives upside down. How long did it take you to come to terms with what your father had done? Well, it was a very incremental process. Um, for a very long time I tried to hold on to the image of my father that I remembered uh, as a very young child, he didn't become radicalized until I was six or seven. And so I held on to this, these memories of my father taking me to the park and playing games together and being the loving and humorous man that I remembered from a very early age. Um, it wasn't until after he was sentenced to life in prison, his role in the, in the World Trade Center plot was, uh, was exposed that I began to take a closer look at his beliefs uh, and what it meant to try and use violence uh, as a means of resolving um, you know, any issues that you may have. Uh, and I realized that it only perpetuated the cycle, uh, but still it was many years before I really began to understand just how uh, impactful his actions were on me and my family. Um, you've, as I mentioned in the intro, taken a decidedly different tact in your journey but as you said, you know, I guess your father didn't start out as an extremist. Can you walk us through what happened to make him the way he was? Uh, you know, his connection to the Muslim community was something that was very important to him and to my family. Uh, and uh, growing up in Pittsburgh, we were you know, very close to the Muslim community there. And unfortunately, he had an incident um, where he was accused of uh, abusing uh, sexually assaulting a woman, um, no charges were ever filed, and, and it seemed as though, uh, um, you know, this had been done as a way of trying to extort money from our family, uh, but it wreaked havoc on my father's reputation in the Muslim community, and that ultimately led us to New Jersey, uh, where his cousin offered him another job. Uh, but he became disconnected from the Muslim community which was very important to him. I think that gave him uh, a sense of identity and it also reminded him of his home uh, in Egypt where he was from. Uh, and then while we were in New Jersey, he was severely electrocuted uh, at work uh, th through an accident and uh, received third degree burns and was sent home on painkillers and antidepressants and, and unable to work and being separated from, uh, from his faith as he saw it, uh, I think led him to become very isolated and perhaps bitter toward the world. Uh, and unfortunately, that was also around the same time that he began interacting with the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman, who would ultimately be responsible for uh, masterminding the World Trade Center bombing uh, and the other men involved uh, and spending less and less time at home and more time with these men. Mm -hmm. Zach, at one point in the book, you say you were groomed to kind of follow in your father's footsteps. Uh, what happened to, to deviate your track, would you say? Well, for one, the bullying, uh, while, while giving me some of the worst experiences of my life, it taught me a lot about empathy. Uh, because I had been taught so many negative stereotypes, essentially that anyone outside of this very narrow view 
of what it means to be a good person, uh, that anyone outside of that view was a potential threat. Um, I was intimately familiar with stereotyping people, uh, but I also knew what it was like to be stereotyped either because of the color of my skin or my race or my religion. Um, and when it came time to victimize others based on these stereotypes I'd been taught, I realized that I was in fact no better than the people who had bullied me, uh, and I wanted to be better. And so it was a very conscious effort on my part to try and rid myself of the stereotypes that I'd been taught. Your, your mother at one point says in the book, she says, I'm so tired of hating people. How much of an impact did that have on you, those words? Uh, it was one of the most significant experiences of my life. Um, because not only could I see on her face and knowing our story and knowing everything that she had gone through, uh, in one night she went from being a, a Muslim housewife to having to deal with police and the FBI and, and death threats and raising her children alone. And, and you could see on her face when she said that just how much she really meant this idea that hatred, one, can take such a physical and emotional toll on you. Uh, and you could see it in her eyes. But it was also like she was giving me permission to go out into the world and, and to view it as openly as possible without any prejudice. Uh, and just accept people for the way they are and the way that they treat you. Now there's this new threat of ISIS, and it seems as though ISIS is recruiting an awful lot of young people. Um, what do you think it is about their message that's resonating, and how do you counter that sort of thing? Well, it's certainly not new. Uh, you know, these groups have always tried to find those who are marginalized and most susceptible to indoctrination of hateful ideologies like that one. Uh, certainly in the age of technology that we live in, um, more people are aware of it, uh, more people are susceptible to that message. Uh, I think it's in extremely important to realize, one, why they use social media, for example, to try and spread their message. One, sure, it gets to some people who could possibly, uh, you know, be convinced to join their side. Uh, but I think it's also more propaganda for those who, you know, vehemently disagree with the way they live. One, it, it, it creates uh, almost this name brand recognition with groups like ISIS. Uh, and it also works to try and isolate Muslims, for example, in the United States or in Canada um, after the unfortunate events uh, recently. It, it, it works to marginalize those groups, to make others feel fearful of them. And that's why it's so important that our individual reaction, that we are aware that stereotyping people are marginalizing certain groups based on religion or race, uh, can be so harmful. That's why I think in the wake of violence from groups like these, we have to press on even harder in uh, creating a more open society and, and allowing those who may feel marginalized a place in society where they can feel that they're accepted for who they are. Uh, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. The majority of Muslims are not extremists, but do you think that the majority of them should be speaking out more fervently about this? So you know, hijacking of the religion in many respects. Well, I think there are many uh, groups and individuals around the world, Muslims, who uh, have been speaking out against these sorts of acts for a very, very long time. And unfortunately, with each new violent attack, uh, you can hear the, the voices of Muslims around the world um, arguing that this is not their version of the religion. Uh, at the same time, I don't necessarily believe that it's the responsibility of anyone in particular represent who, who believes in a certain faith to say, look, I am not a terrorist or I am not an extremist just because of my, fa my faith. Um, I think it's up to ourselves as individuals to realize that just because a person is of a particular faith or a particular re religion or grew up in a, a particular region, that does not mean anything about the quality of that person's character. Uh, I think as individuals, regardless of our background, we need to remember not to try and use, you know, generalized stereotypes about people uh, in our daily lives. How do we counter fundamentalism in any ideology, would you say? What's the best method of doing that? 
Well, the best method is to take away those potential, those people who can potentially join groups, uh, extremist groups. Uh, and we can do that by not marginalizing people, not stereotyping people based on their race or their religion or their sexuality or any of the other many reasons that uh, that some find to, uh, to, to show difference between people. Uh, it's very important that in the wake of attacks uh, or, or in, in fear of these groups that we don't change our society uh, to reflect those fears. We need to remain hopeful and realize that the vast majority of people in the world, regardless of their faith or no faith at all, uh, just want to raise their families and live safely and, and, and ha provide an education for their families. Uh, keeping those things in mind and, and judging each person based on their individual character as opposed to arbitrary measurements uh, really, I think, is the best way to approach it. I, I don't necessarily believe that uh, there's political solutions. I don't think, in general, politicians have much incentive uh, to to try and uh, you know break down the status quo. Uh, and certainly, we see that uh, military options uh, often perpetuate the violence and, and and make it much worse. So politicians, military—they're not the answer. Is the author an answer? I mean, who who do you want to reach with this book, and and what do you want as the takeaway? Well, one of the main reasons that I wrote it was, obviously, I wanted to give people insight into what it was like growing up in this ideology uh, and, and to shed some light on the experiences that I had that brought me out of it, the lessons that I learned from those experiences about empathy, about accepting people um, based on how they treat you rather than arbitrary stereotypes. Uh, and I also wanted to show people who may not have interactions with Muslims on a daily basis that uh, although I am no longer a Muslim, uh, that the vast that my experience was extremely unique among Muslims. The vast majority of them are never exposed to levels of extremism that I was, and if I can come out of it promoting acceptance of people and and, and peace, then what does that say about the vast majority of Muslims in the world? It's a great message, Zach. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. When we come back, the impact of peaceful resistance movements. Why isn't the world paying more attention to nonviolence?